Welcome to the City of Bath Climate Action Commission Climate Conversations. Um, I'm Rod Melanson. I'm the Director of Sustainability for the City of Bath. And just wanted to do a quick welcome and introduction of what we're doing here tonight. This is the event uh, series wrap up session here. This is our last one for this year. Uh, we've held numerous ones starting in October um, and ending in this month. We, I do want to say that we've had about this turnout each time. We have about 30 or so people on Zoom right now as well. And these are really great conversations. So we're going to continue this series and you'll be seeing that next year. We'll kind of publish the entire year series. And I wanted to um, really give a round of applause to the Climate Action Commission who puts this all together, multiple volunteer hours, uh, more than once a month meeting, not just about this series, but about climate action planning for the community. Um, they're really pushing the envelope with what we're doing for the city of Bath. And I just wanted to provide a kudos to them. That being said, I'll kind of give you an alert to what's upcoming as well. Uh, the city of Bath is undertaking a, a heavy lift on a climate action plan update. You'll be hearing a lot more about that in the coming months. Um, so please stay tuned on that. I did want to put a plug into uh, next month, May 16th, Another one of my sustainability hats is transportation bike ped. There'll be a uh, bike e-bike demo day on May 16th uh, with a bike documentary movie being shown at Union & Co on Center Street. Uh, that is the Bike and Pet Pedestrian Committee is putting that together for May 16th. This series that I mentioned with Climate Conversations, I do wanna say is all archived online at the Patent Free Library. It dates back to last year's series as well. So if you, it's a really good way to kind of leisurely check out uh, some of the past conversations. You can fast forward, you can rewind, it's wonderful. Um, that being said, I wanna hand this off to Nancy Sfera this evening. She is a retired land management director for the Nature Conservancy down in Brunswick um, and an expert in the field of climate resiliency and landscaping and land management. And also, I should say, when I did the shout out to Climate Action Commission, Nancy serves on multiple committees. She's the chair of the Forestry Committee. She's on bike pad, transportation. It's really quite wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. One of the things I'm not going to get, get into in this talk is really all the numbers about um, carbon uh, modeling and all that kind of stuff. I really want to talk about what you can do in your yard to benefit biodiversity, whatever you're doing to benefit biodiversity is also going to be beneficial in terms of our climate. So I'm not going to get into all the geeky numbers or anything. Um, I really want to talk more about what you can do and techniques you can do in your yard. So one of the things I'm going to go through are some, some uh, just some pointers for you uh, in terms of gardening. And then the other thing, or landscaping, and then the other thing, sorry. And then the other thing I want to do is um, <laughs> uh, go through two examples. So I'm going to give an example of my own property in Bath, and then I'm going to invite Nancy Perkins to come up and uh, give an example of what she's done on her property. Uh, one of the things that um, I do want to mention that both our examples are from um, properties that are close to downtown. So we have in in town lots but we're maybe a little bit lucky in terms of some in-town lots. We have relatively large yards by bath standards um, for an in-town lot. So um, let's get into, uh, oops. Sorry, she's got the, there. she's got, got the mouse on the wrong side um, for me. So I wanna just give a couple of um, caveats for this. If you're worried about you know, your time, your money that you have to put towards this, even small steps are gonna be beneficial. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of really small properties in, in Bath. This is an example of a, a front yard. Uh, this is actually the Kelt office. Um, and this is all they have to work with. Uh, and this is all gonna get demolished and redone um, within the next couple, couple of years. But, um, 
even if you have a small property, there's things you can do that can benefit biodiversity and be beneficial for the climate. Um, you shouldn't worry about doing everything all at once. I've lived in Bath for, this will be my eighth growing season coming up. I'm still working on my property. I'm going to be working on doing my projects for the next probably 10 years. Um, it's going to be a little bit at a time as I have time and money. The other thing I do want to mention is even though native species have the greater benefits uh, for biodiversity, it's really hard to get all native species. They're very hard to source from the nurseries that we have. You shouldn't feel bad if you have some non-native species in your yard, as long as they're not invasive. So if you know that there are species that aren't gonna get um, out into our, our natural areas, um, you shouldn't worry about having some non-native species in your on your property. So just some statistics to keep in mind. Um, the reason why we're doing some of this, the birds in uh, the US and Canada have declined 30% since 1970. So if I went out and counted the birds in the US and Canada in 1970, and then counted them again today, we would have 2.9 billion fewer birds today than we had back in 1970. A lot of it has to do with, with habitat loss um, and the fact that you know people have um, some really pristine lawns in their yards that have no benefit whatsoever for um, some of our birds. 40% of all insect species are in decline globally. Uh, and I know a lot of people don't like insects, but boy, they're really, really important when it comes to biodiversity and having um, those insects around are gonna help us bring our birds back and be more climate resilient. In Germany, they did a study over the past 26 years and they found there was a 75% decline in insects um, uh, in Germany. We can probably estimate that it's probably the same in North America. There are 63 million acres of lawn in the United States. Those lawns take 3 trillion gallons of water annually, 200 million gallons of gas to do the mowing uh, of the lawns, 70 million pounds of pesticides, and that includes herbicides that we put on our lawns to get rid of weed species. And then 30% of the potable water in the U.S. is used to irrigate lawns and gardens. Um, now, yeah, and golf courses. <laughs> And, um, you know, we're in a pretty good situation in the Northeast. We don't have to irrigate as much as other people do, but still um, a lot of people are irrigating their lawns, even if they don't need to. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. For every um, every time you irrigate your lawn, there's a chance that there's gonna be runoff into our water system that carries those herbicides and pesticides into our water systems. So I wanna start talking about spring cleanup because everybody's, get itchy to get out in the garden. Um, we want to get out and clean up our yards. This is my front, one of my front perennial beds. This is what it looks like today. I have not cleaned up any of it. Um, my neighbors over there are probably saying, when are you going to do it? But I, ha I haven't cleaned any of it up. I'm not going to clean it up until the temperatures are consistently in the 50s because our insects are overwintering in leaf litter. They're overwintering in dead standing stems or in the soil. And if you clear all that stuff off too early, you're going to impact their ability to um, come out. You mean consistently a high of 50 or consistently a low of 50? Consistently a high of 50, yeah. Um, the um, And I, I'm actually going to wait until probably the early part of May to do that. One other way you can do it rather than waiting for the temperatures, once you see the solitary bees come out or bumblebees, it's safe to clean up your garden. So... Um, in the fall, you might want to consider rather than raking up your leaves, just mulching them with a lawnmower. I abuse my lawnmower. I just run all over the leaves and just leave them on my lawn. Those leaves are going to going to decompose over the winter. Even if there's snow cover on your on your yard, there's decomposition that's going on underneath snow. And so I just leave it on my soil, my uh, lawn. They're going to decompose over time, and I, it means that you have less of need for fertilizers in your yard if you leave all that material um, on your property. If you feel like you need to rake the leaves, you might consider doing a compost bin um, and using those leaves then to mulch your gardens um, later in the season rather than setting them out for pickup. Um, I steal leaves from my neighbors, they put them out and I ask if I can have some of their leaves. So there's a couple of piles in my yard from my neighbors. They're very nice. Um, 
So, so I'm going to get out and clean all this stuff. And I actually don't do a great job of cleaning up. Um, the other thing I, I do want to show is yeah. um, right here are some old seed heads of coneflower. I leave Oh, great. Um, yeah, Ruth, I'm just a panelist and not a host. Okay. Yeah, yeah so ask. Oh, I have panelists. Thanks for your patience. Okay, great. Share screen. Great. Okay. It's on those pages. Yep. Um, Okay. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. So, continuing on. Um, there's been a, an effort the past couple of years to promote something called No Mo May, 
where um, there people are being asked to not go out and mow in May to allow those species in their lawn, um, those flowering species in their lawns to flower and provide nectaring uh, sources for the early emerging bees. Um, and the picture on the, the left is my own lawn. Um, there's uh, things like dandelions and bluets and violets, and this is bugleweed, um, which is not native, but it's it provides early um, flowering plants and nectaring sources for insects in the spring. And so if you um, don't mow during May, uh, you're providing that those kinds of food sources to be available to the insects. Now, one of the things that you can do, if you don't like the look of long grass, um, you can just raise your mower deck up uh, a couple inches, and then you're basically mowing over the top of the plants, but the lower plants that still have flowers available, um, you're still benefiting those insects. And then the other thing you can do, and I've done this in my yard, is I'll do a mosaic mowing where I just avoid the flowering plants and mow down the other stuff. And so there's ways you can do it without eliminating mowing altogether. So a little bit about pollinators in, um, in Maine, of course, you know, we all hear about the honeybees. Honeybees are not native. And what we have are mostly solitary bees um, that nest in, um, they, they tend to nest in hollow stems, they nest in cavities in the ground, they nest in cavities in other places. And then they there are also um, bees that have small colonies that include our bumblebees. They typically are, bumblebees are typically um, nesting in the ground, having their colonies in the ground. One of the things about bumblebees, when you see bumblebees coming out in the spring, those are the queens. What happens is in the fall, all the workers and drones die, but the queen is it gets her eggs fertilized. She's carrying fertilized eggs when she comes out in the spring and she's looking for places to have a new colony. So by ha making sure that you have early um, uh, nectar plants available for the queen, she's able, able to, to source for her eggs and, and um, have her colony uh, well established. The other thing is that not all not all um, pollinators are bees. So, for instance, um, the the photo on the right it's a bee mimic. It's actually a fly. You can tell flies from bees, and that flies only have one pair of wings. Um, and bees and wasps have two pairs of wings. That's how you can tell them apart. But they're they can be important pollinators too. Butterflies and moths are pollinators. Crane flies can pollinate. So it's not just the bees and that we should be worried about, but a larger suite of insects that we should be worried about in terms of our pollinators. Keep in mind that one in three bites of your food is directly related to pollination. I'm going to remember that every time I eat. Um, <laughs> the other thing is there are a lot of beneficial insects out there. And so if you're one of those people that has to go out and spray, you're probably um, impacting a lot of beneficial insects that can do the work for you. An example here is the tomato hornworm. This was from one of my gardens. Um, and the tomato hornworm can denude a tomato plant in a matter of days. But there's a wasp that lays its eggs on the tomato hornworm, which is what you see here. And the larvae hatch and they feed on the body of the tomato horn, hornworm. And so they're doing your job for you um, rather than going out and spraying BT. BT will kill um, the caterpillar, but it also kills every other caterpillar that comes in contact with it. And so you're not doing, you may think you're doing targeted applications, but um, you're actually impacting a broader range of, of uh, uh, caterpillars. And if you kill all the adult, um, tomato hornworms, the wasps can't do their, their jobs. So keeping in mind that there are beneficial insects. So we're talking a little bit about lawns. Um, with lawns, there are a couple strategies. Um, you can diversify your lawn or you can minimize your lawn. I'm doing a little bit of both. This picture is taken from my backyard. Um, that's a shot of my lawn. Uh, I did a little survey and counted species. There's at least 12 different species in that picture. Um, in my lawn, including clover. Uh, the benefits of clover is that it's a nitrogen fixer. And if you have clover in your yard, the nitrogen is going to help your other plants that are in your grass. Um, the 
the benefit of having a really diverse lawn like this rather than having just grass is that you're benefiting soil health, you're benefiting more insects than if you just had grass alone. Uh, one way to get a more diverse lawn like this, obviously, is not to spray it with herbicide. Um, the other way is to, um, to not mow as frequently, and you'll get some of these broad-leaved um, forbs in your, your lawn. Um, most of these species that you're looking at in this picture are not native. Um, it's really hard to have a native, um, a native species lawn in Maine because grasslands are not a typical habitat in uh, Maine unless you're in really, really sandy soils. Um, the by having a really diverse lawn like this too, you if there's a pest species that gets into your lawn, you're less likely to have. Uh, broad scale negative impacts to your to your lawn. So an example there would be if you had um, larva of the June bug, those little grubs will feed on the roots of grass stems, uh, gra grass plants, kill the grass, and you'll have these big giant patches of brown grass in your yard. You won't get that in a lawn that's as diverse as this um, because there's lots of other plants that take their place. The um, and a lawn like this, you're reducing the use of herbicides and fertilizers um, that can get into our waterways through runoff. The, there was a um, study done in Massachusetts that um, they looked at the differences between mowing every week, every two weeks, and every three weeks. Because some people will go out and mow their lawn every week. I don't know why. Um, I'm a little too lazy to do that. Um, and what they found was that if you can um, wait and go out and mow your lawn every two weeks, you'll have far more bee species on your property. You'll have a more diverse um, lawn. You'll also save money in time and in gas. And one of the other things they looked at, because a lot of people think that if I, I have to go out and mow because I want to eliminate ticks in my yard, what they did, they also looked at ticks. And they found that there was absolutely no difference between mowing every week and mowing every two weeks or three weeks. Um, in terms of tick numbers. The other thing they did found was that there was not much of a difference in bee um, abundance if you went out every two weeks versus every three weeks. So every two weeks seems to be the sweet spot um, if you're looking to save some money. The other thing is I use a mulching mower in my yard. I never pick up my grass clippings. They all go right back into the onto the lawn. Um, that way that all becomes fertilizer for the for the lawn in the future. So the other strategy is to minimize your lawn. I've been doing this slowly over the course of seven years, um, and I'll show you examples of that. But by planting perennial um, perennial gardens, especially if you're focusing on native species, those perennial plants, once established, really don't need much fertilizer. They don't take as much water as if you you had a, um, uh, if it, as much water as if you had um, a lawn. Uh, they provide great nectar sources for pollinators and hummingbirds, uh, uh, sweetest species, and they provide suit, uh, seed, fruit, and, and um, insects for feeding birds. So getting uh, perennial gardens established is really good. What you want to do is you want to aim for a lot of different height structure. Um, so instead of just focusing on, on low growing plants, you want to have some really high plants. It's always good to intersperse some shrubs into your perennial beds. Um, because they they add some more um, height and, and uh, cover structure to your gardens. Oh, by the way, that um, let me go back. That um, plant in the photo. Uh, I can't go back. There we go. Go back. The plant in that photo is butterfly weed. Um, which is a native uh, honey uh, milkweed, and uh, it it grows really great in my yard. Um, so I highly recommend that as a, a perennial plant to put in your garden. Whoops, keep doing that. Carmen, you mentioned for the use of pesticides on your lawn, mm -hmm. the June bug. Does that also apply to using a biological, like a milky spore, or? You know, I don't know much about um, milky spore. I, I I haven't used anything like that. I don't know how um, target specific milky spore is. Um, one of the issues with a lot of these things is, um, you know, when you think about when you think about your soil and your leaf litter, 
there's a lot of other organisms that are in that. And they're doing things like decomposing your leaf litter and cycling nutrients. To give you an example, the same study where I was doing the mites um, at Michigan State University, we would take little plugs of, of leaf litter out of the forest um, and run them through a um, contraption to, to um, extract all of the, the organisms out of it, all the invertebrates out of it. I had one sample that was, they're about three inches in diameter and they're about inch and a half in thickness. I had 10,000 mites in one sample. And so by putting stuff, those, those kinds of um, chemicals on your lawn, they may only have a short-term impact, but they're gonna have an impact on all those things that are living in your, your on your property. So I think you wanna be a little bit careful about what you're using. I can't talk, speak to milky spore. I've never, I've never used it, so I'm not sure um, how target specific it is. So, um, planting native trees is always a better option than planting a non-native species. There's a guy, Doug um, Tallamy, who he's out of Delaware, and he did a study where he looked at insect abundance on on different tree species, and found that by far our native trees support far more insect species than our non-native trees. In some cases, some non-native trees have like no insects on them practically. Um, so one of the things he found was that native oaks, cherries, elms, and maples support a huge number of insects. And I know a lot of people don't like insects, but again, I just wanna hammer how important they are ecologically. An example, somebody um, determined that it takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one brood of five chickadees in a year. And so you think about how many, how many caterpillars you need to have. Um, so I highly recommend planting native trees. One of the things that, um, that you can also do is instead of just putting a single tree in and having grass all around it, you may want to have it as a centerpiece of your perennial bed where you have shrubs around it and then other perennial plants. So you have it more of a, more of an ecosystem rather than a tree in the middle of your lawn. Another option is to rewild your yard. And this just means you just quit mowing or you might spread um, wildflower seeds, um, create a, a seed bed and create and spread wildflower seeds. And you sort of just let it grow and do what it's gonna do. I have a couple corners of my yard that I'm rewilding. I've just stopped mowing back there. The one thing that I do is I do go out and I do have to take invasives out of that section because I have multiflora rose in my yard. I have. Uh, bittersweet in my yard, and I have to go out and selectively remove that in those sites where I'm not um, no longer mowing. One thing is to be really careful. If you see a packet of seeds that's labeled as native wildflower seeds, you be, better be careful because sometimes those don't have native wildflowers to the, to our area, or they and they sometimes do um, have invasives in them. It's better to get them from a, a really reputable source like the Wild Seed Project, um, which sells, um, they sell native seeds uh, that you can be sure that you're, of what you're getting. Um, and once established, these things really need to be watered or fertilized. Um, and so it's a great way to sort of build some, um, some habitat in your yard. Uh, mine, I'm I'm keeping it, well, I'm going to get to this, but I'm keeping it in the corner um, so it's not sort of out in the middle of the yard. And there's a couple of good examples of this in, in Bath, um, right out here by the library, across from the library is a, a rewild front yard. What's the name of that place? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good, a good example. Um, and then vegetable gardens. Uh, more and more people are starting to, to grow their own vegetables on their properties. I have a vegetable garden. It doesn't look that nice. Uh, that's in the picture. That's not mine. Um, but it does diversify your yard. Um, and there's ways to, to intersperse your vegetables with annuals that do provide nectar sources for, um, for bees and, and provide um, other sources for other insects. Um, the, um, the other thing, if you don't, can't, don't have the space to put it in a vegetable garden. You can also intersperse your vegetables in with your perennial plants um, and grow vegetables within your other beds. Um, I probably grow about 40% of my food out of my yard. So I want to go through um, 
what I've done on my property. Um, this is a picture of my backyard at the point of time um, just before I moved in. This is my realtor photo um, in the, my house listing. Um, like I said, I have a relatively big backyard and, um, and some good hedgerows along the edges of my yard. This maple tree that's in the um, photo is no longer there. It was starting to die. It was leaning towards the house. I had to take it da taken down. Luckily, it's a Norway maple, so I don't miss it um, because... And I don't know if you all know, but Norway maple, maples can comprise about 45% of the tree canopy in Bath. So, um, yeah, they're not great. So I'm going to go through my yard as it is now. So this is my yard today. I took this picture out of my upstairs window yesterday. Um, and just to go through a couple things that I'm doing here. Um, so I have had really good hedgerows along the margins of my yard. I'm maintaining, keeping those. Um, one thing that I am doing is I'm occasionally going out and removing things like the multiflora rose and, and the bittersweet. Um, in terms of my perennial beds, one way to think about where to put your perennial beds is to look at where the sun is, look at where your steep slopes are. If you have steep slopes, perfect place to put a perennial bed because um, you don't wanna mow that. Um, this area in my yard, is almost all ledge. So it's a perfect place for me to keep my lawn because I'm not gonna be able to grow anything else there. Uh, back in this back corner and this back corner are where I'm doing some rewilding. I've started, stopped mowing back there. Um, I run four compost bins and a leaf mulch pile. Um, this is my, my um, vegetable garden. These two beds up here are the only two beds that were there when I moved in. So all this stuff is new. Um, and I have a couple of rain barrels down here. Um, this is a new perennial bed um, that went in a couple of years ago. It's a work in progress. And then I have, um, I planted a sour cherry tree and a peach tree here last year um, with the intention of having, being able to get food off my property. But also, as those trees grow up, they're going to provide cover, better cover for birds coming into my bird feeder. Um, and so I, I'm, um, I'm slowly adding uh, those things to my yard. So I'm going to go a little bit more into detail on some of these. One of the things I'm doing, um, this is the long bed that I put in a couple of years ago. This is just after we finished building it. My family was out visiting. I made them do it. Um, so it was great. We had it, had it done in like two hours. Um, but I use sheet mulch method. I'm not digging any of my gardens. Everything is, I'm putting cardboard and newspaper down um, in a thick layer. On top of that, I'm putting grass clippings or leaf mulch or other um, easily decomposable material. And then on top of that, I'm putting a mixture of compost and um, topsoil. And then it's immediately available for planting. Um, it, this is a work in progress. I still have a bunch more stuff that I need to put in that, that particular garden. Um, and by the way, I do run a couple bird baths too. I have like three bird baths going in my backyard. Um, so I'm using a uh, sheep mulch, mulch method for everything. I haven't dug, a, I don't think, a single garden in my yard. Um, one thing I do recommend is if you're thinking about doing some perennial beds is to avoid using landscape fabric. Um, that it's, you know, it's marketed as a weed barrier after a couple of years, it's nothing but a weed, um, uh, attractant. You try to pull the weeds out of it and you pull up the landscape fabric with it. Um, and you're just, you're just introducing plastic into your yard, which is not a great thing. So, um, this sheet mulch, mulch method works really, really well. The vegetable garden, um, I've increased it to about 40 feet by 40 feet, um, I do everything with raised beds. The beds are made out of as much as I possibly can. The beds are made out of long um, lasting materials. So I'm using uh, metal roofing panels. I have some repurposed plastic lumber that somebody was getting rid of. Uh, I have some uh, old food grade barrels that I'm using for beds. The um, the one, the beds that are wood, um, I only have a couple of beds that are wood. Uh, are repurposed wood rather than new wood. Um, so I'm trying to do all um, recycled materials. Uh, the one thing that um, you'll see in this picture 
is a lot of wood chips in between my beds. I was doing that for a couple of years just to keep the, the weeds between my beds down. I'm going to quit doing that. I want to have those plants between my beds so that there's there's something for the um, like dandelions and stuff for the the insects to to um, to utilize. So I'm I'm actually letting that go back to to weeds between my my raised beds. Um, I interplant everything with um, with annuals like nasturtium and marigolds to diversify my vegetable garden um, and run. I have four 50 gallon uh, rain barrels running off the roof that I then pump back to my garden um, and store back by the garden. So I, I do, during drought periods, I do have to water my garden, but for the most part, I'm getting a lot of my water. Last year, I didn't water the garden once, I don't think. Who did? Nobody. <laughs> so, so that's my vegetable garden. Uh, I keep doing that. And then um, along the sides of my yard, um, I'm letting all the, the trees remain. Um, I'm letting it being as mess, be as messy as possible. Um, I'm starting to weed out, like I said, I'm weeding out the, the invasives as much as I can. And on one section of the, the yard, um, there's a whole bunch of lilacs and I'm starting to thin those out because I want other stuff. Uh, to grow in there. There's choke cherry that's growing along the, the hedgerow. There's some American elm that has been resprouting. American elms are going to die because of Dutch elm disease. But then when they resprout, I just let them grow until they, they get up to a certain age and, um, and then um, remove them. And then um, there's some red maples that are coming up and some white pines. Again, white pines. I don't want to have white pines next to the house because we all saw what the white pines did this la the last couple storms. But I'm letting them grow for a little while and then I'm going to take them down and they'll get replaced by something else. Um, I'm trying to intersperse things like um, I have planted some elderberry, berry, some hornbeam and some hazelnut. I got one hazelnut this past year. Yeah. It was delicious. Um, the other thing, I'm leaving some stags. Uh, this one is a, um, a dead Norway maple Yay. that came down um, this winter. I'm leaving that there for woodpeckers. Uh, I've Back here is a dead um, elm tree. I'm leaving that. And the dead elm tree uh, is great for uh, some edible mushrooms. Those are enoki mushrooms. And they're growing on that stump? Yep. Uh, not, on this, uh, not on this stump, but they're growing back on the elm tree. Um, and enokis love elms. Um, and I've gotten uh, some pheasant back off my dead elm trees too. And then this the stump there is the stump from the Norway maple that I said I had taken down and I just left it in my perennial bed. Um, and it's just kind of fun to watch the um, the fungus take over. And I'm just going to leave it there uh, as a just to have. <laughs> so another thing I want to talk about is the practice of safe gardening. Um, so this fall, I did find. Asian jumping worms in my garden. Um, this, these are the worms that I pulled out and stuck in a bucket to kill. Um, and one of the ways that you can tell Asian jumping worms, other than the fact that they wiggle violently when you pick them up, um, the way that I find it easiest to identify them is you can see this looks like it's iridescent green. They have really have an iridescent look to them uh, when you get them in the light compared to other earthworms. There's also um, on the clitellum, which is the band that goes around the worm, goes all the way around the body versus in um, other earthworms, it stops before it gets there. One thing I will say is in glaciated Northeast, earthworms are not native period. Um, so all of our North earthworms are not native, but these are particularly problematic um, because they stay in the upper reaches of the soil. Um, and eat all the leaf litter that you have on top of the soil. And they're not good at, um, at cycling those nutrients down into your vegetable uh, or into your, your soil. There, in particular, there, people are worried about these getting out in the forest. And if they get out into our natural native forest, then they could have a real impact on um, nutrient cycling in our forests. There is a really good handout on the back table about Asian drum, jumping worms. So what's your preferred method of elimination? Um, I don't have one. <laughs> uh, these, are, you know, these are just stuck in a bucket and let them dry out. 
Um, you can put them in soapy water and let them drown. Um, some people put them in vinegar. So um, the uh, the other thing, so if you're getting um, uh, compost like delivered to your house, you want to ask them about the compost, where they're getting it from, whether they know whether there are jumping worm um, jumping worms in that soil. If they get it delivered, um, uh, if you get it delivered to the house, uh, you might want to cover it with clear plastic for a number of days to let it cook for a bit because these things are all only in the top portion of the soil um, and then it'll kill them off before you move it all back to your garden. If you're trading plants with your neighbors, um, you want to make sure they don't have jumping worms if you're if you're digging up plants and taking them to your yard. The other thing with trading plants with neighbors, you want to make sure that there aren't any weed seeds in those plants that you might not like. So I made the mistake when I was a young gardener um, of, of getting a plant, digging up a plant from a, a neighbor's yard that I really liked. And I brought it to my house and, and put it in. Unbeknownst to me, there were little fragments of mint in it. And I had mint everywhere. Don't ever plant mint in your garden. It's like, <laughs> unless you're putting it in a pot in the ground where it can't escape. But um, so I had mint everywhere. I was chasing mint for three years. Uh, so really be really careful when you're trading plants with people. Um, and even when, when you're going to the nursery to get plants to make sure that, um, for instance, if they can have all their potted plants on the ground, don't buy them because stuff can come up through the ground and get into those potted plants. Um, if they're on, you know, racks, then you're much safer, uh, in terms of what you're getting from the nursery. Uh, bare root plants are safe, are always safer, um, and you might consider just propagating your own um, plants uh, from seeds or cuttings. We have a lot of mint. Does mint have no beneficial? I mean, it does. I mean, things are things will um, will visit. You know, pollinators will visit mint and stuff. And right. and from a you know, if you like, you know, mint tea and stuff. Uh, but it, it can it can spread yeah. really bad, and it can really take over depending on the plant, the, the mint. Yeah. Is anybody keeping track of jumping worms? If we find them, should we report them they, to somebody? They had been, I think the state had been taking records, but now they're finding them so widespread that they're, they're now saying it, it doesn't matter. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not just restricted to bath, bath. It's they're finding them all over the place, so, which is unfortunate. So, um, so that's the experience from my yard, um, mm -hmm. including the jumping worms. Um, so I wanted- Are those the same as the hammerhead worms? No. They're different than hammerhead worms. Yeah, I mean, Not that I know of, yeah. and so hopefully we won't. And yeah. How about those red worms that people use for compost? Are those okay? Yeah, those are okay. So they die off. Right? Yeah. Well, the the jumping worms die in the winter too. <laughs> but what happens is um, the the cocoons, the egg cases, are um, still in the soil, and they could be viable for up to four years. And so, and with a regular, so this Michigan State University project I worked on. We also had to do earthworm um, sampling. And so we were sifting big things of soil and we'd have to pull all the earthworm cocoons out of this, the samples. And most of the time they're green. They're like this this little um, sort of bright, bright green color. Um, so they're relatively easy to find. Jumping worms are brown. You can't find those cocoons if you're looking for them. Yeah, so, which is unfortunate. So we're, up, we're gonna have time for more. Um, questions, uh, but I want to invite uh, Nancy up to talk about what she's done on her property. I just uh, um, offered to share uh, my experience with our yard um, and uh, just preface it all that we've been there 27 years. So by the time I really went for the native um, <laughs> students. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Um, uh, it, we had a pretty good um, um, base to work from. So um, I, I just feel like I need to uh, say that. <clears throat> so anyway, so it's an 1840s house and we are um, inclined to be project people. So we've been working on this a fair amount of time. And so the photo on the left it is uh, probably 2018 or so. And it was a nice yard and all, but mostly people just sat on the deck and never went into the yard. And and it was, I don't know, it, it wasn't very alive or something. And at the same time, I was hearing about their rewilding and native planting. And 
um, got really interested in that. So I just sort of went for it. And I went to the nursery and filled, filled up the car and just started digging places in the yard. Um, wait a minute. Yep, there. Okay, so I jumped too far. Yeah, okay, here we go. All right, so anyway, I um, dug and dug and dug. I got, took out my spade and I was digging up all the lawn. It was really um, cathartic. And, it, <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's so much heavy news that it just felt like something that I could do and was um, challenged by how do we make spaces for these insects and birds that we want and need. So I just kept going for it. And the one on the right, I think, is April. Was it, uh, so, I did, so I did that in 21, the fall of 21, and then that's April 21. And uh, then that's two weeks later, the one on the left. So there's hope. It's, that's the beginning of May, I think. Um, and then we did the no mo May. <laughs> so I got rid of a lot of lawn um, and uh, what little lawn we had left, we let grow. It, it helped that we went away, so it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so gradually I just started going to the uh, landscape places and, and just getting shrubs. And the first thing we did was take out our uh, a burning bush. We had a few of those um, and anything invasive. We um, got rid of those. And then I just started, well, we had the trees pretty well, but we started getting small trees and then shrubs, deciduous and evergreen. And, um, and then the next year, I just really was starting on the ground cover and perennials. Um, but so some of the joys are um so even though there's not much lawn there's um space to play and there's like three or four grandkids in there looking for uh wild strawberries <laughs> so this is just those moments that just feel good another um joy is uh discovering a bird bath so that on the left hand side the rock was part of our rock old <coughs> wall that we have. Um, and so my husband took, I'm not sure what tool he took, but he spent a couple hours, you know, um, very dusty, but um, <laughs> ended up with um, this great little bird bath. And it's just so pleasurable to look out the window and see these birds. They just love it so much. And they're just, just out there just splashing. And so that, that was kind of unexpected to me, but, um, I highly recommend that. And then just seeing a, a monarch is just, it's just hopeful. So then uh, the one on the left, I think is kind of like, we're getting there, you know, that was like August, I think of last year. And um, it's tidier version of your, than your yard. <laughs> but, um, but I was kind of ready for a break, but, um, that wasn't to be because we discovered we had hemlocks on the right that we had planted 25 years ago, but um, they had the woolly adelgid. And I just really didn't want to look to see if they were there, so I didn't. <laughs> and then they were. So, and they were too far gone. So we could have had sprayed them, but uh, uh, arborists thought we were going to have to cut them down in a few years anyways because they're kind of the wrong plant, and, you know, just getting too big. So we cut them down. So that, and uh, that meant this shady area was suddenly full of sun. So we had to figure out what we, what we were going to do with that area. So the benefit is the sun brought... Uh, you know, more opportunity for uh, on the right hand side. So just a lot of flowering. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty wildish place, but I would, it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then I thought I was done with that. And then last year they spent six months redoing our street. So they were pounding and pounding and it just, it just went on and on and on. And so that uh, kind of upset the front of the yard. So I was like, oh gosh, I gotta have to just dig in again. I'm just getting ready for kind of a break and to do something else. But so we decided to not do a lawn in the front. So we, again, just going and getting more native plants and hoping that it would be beautiful one day. Um, <laughs> and in the process, <laughs> I discovered the jumping worm. And just, oh, it's just so disheartening. And they say, don't panic, but I did. <laughs> and um, I'm still recovering, I guess. Um, so it's here. Sorry, Matt and Julie, I don't know if you have it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, we killed a bunch and um, I'm not sure what we're going to do. We may actually grass in part of it, but, um, and then this is last Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so I feel like there's just going to be constant challenges and problem solving. And so we have a sort of a living fence of arborvitae and the the snow just it was so heavy, though, even though we went out a few times and tried to shake the trees. And, and I mean, they're pretty tall, but um, they don't look very good right now. So I feel like plant choices, it's just all, all going to change. It's just going to be, have to accept the challenge of what what's to come, but that's our yard. But Nancy, you left out the little, the little uh, hidden house. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh. She was on the house tour last year and came back to her garden and it was amazing. Absolutely, I, I had the pleasure of being a host yeah. there, and it was just amazing. Yeah, someday I want my yard to look like that. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, grow up. Yes. So, um, just uh, some resource sources I want to mention. You know, there are a lot of different decisions you can make in terms of what plants to put in your yard. Um, you know, I didn't really go through sort of plant choices because it's all sort of a personal thing. But um, Maine Audubon has a, a native plant finder on their website. And there's some information on the back table about their Bringing Nature Home program, um, advocating for using uh, native species. Androscoggin County Soil and Water Conservation District has a program called Conservation Landscape Certification, where you can fill out um, a questionnaire about the practices that you've done on your own property and then send it into the, um, to the, the office there and they'll send someone out to do a site visit and certify your program as being conservation um, landscaping. There's a Wild Seed Project, which is here in Maine. Um, it's a great source for information on native plants but also um, it, uh, they have seeds for sale, native seeds for sale. Uh, Maine Natural Areas Program has tons of information, especially on things like invasive species um, and, uh, and some of the uh, um, information on um, landscaping with natives. Native Plant Trust used to be New England Wildflower Association. They've also got some information on their website about uh, native uh, planting. University of Maine Co Cooperative Extension has a really great bulletin on um, landscape, landscaping with native plants. And then the U.S. Forest Service Tree Atlas um, is a really kind of a, a fun site um, where you can look at what they predict to be climate impacts on various tree species in the Northeast. And so that way you can sort of avoid planting something like red spruce on your property, which it's not worth planting um, because of climate change. So sort of thinking about um, what plants uh, would be better to plant in the, the um, uh, because of climate change. All that information, these resources, all the website links are on a handout in the back. Um, and so help yourself to that. There's some other stuff on that, um, that too. Um, and so now I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. If you had tall oak trees in your yard with brown tail and bark nests, mm -hmm. what would you do? <laughs> um, I do have tall, tall oak trees in my yard, and they I'm lucky because I don't have any brown tail moth right now. Um, I would hope that we got a really wet, cold spring to um, there's a fungus that gets in the brown tail moths 
that will kill those caterpillars and crash the population. Um, we had that in Bath a number of years ago, and I've since then I haven't had any problems in my yard. Um, but that's what I would hope for. You know, in terms of um, what to do in your own property, if you can't get up to the tops of the trees, I'm not sure um, what your options are. That's a lousy answer, isn't it? But <laughs> I will say that um, the Maine Forest Service has a really great, has a couple really great uh, uh, people on their, entomologists on their staff who can help you out with advice on broad, ground tail moths. There, there's one guy um, who uh, there who, you know, that's, pretty much what he does in the spring is um, do does work on brown tail moth. So you might want to get in touch with uh, Maine Forest Service. You talked about eliminating the invasives, like um, you cited two, mm -hmm. lump or rose and- right. Age added bitter, bittersweet is right. what I have. I've heard somebody say the only way to really do it is with a really horrible chemical. So here's what I do. Um, so in some cases I can, I can pull it up depending on where it is. Um, um, I can, I can actually pull it out of the ground and how old it is. Um, the other, the older stuff I do, um, a really targeted cut and drip. So I'll cut the stem and then drip a little dab of, um, of, uh, uh herbicide on it. Typically, it's um, something that that contains a chemical called triclopyr, and that's how I do it. Just one little dot. I attended a workshop where the person said you use something that they use in bingo games that has a sponge on the end of it, yep. and they fill it with the uh, whatever, yep. and, and dab, dab it, it that way. Yep. And it was very clever. And actually, it's the Harpswell invasive group that oh, yeah. does that. Yep. Yeah, that's a great way. And um, there's stuff online too where you can, they have instructions on how to build one out of PVC pipe. And yeah, yeah. But, you know, you can, you can actually be so very targeted if you do it that way um, without having to use broad, broad scale um, uh, spray. If you lived in an area that had lots and lots of deer, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I moved from Arasic to Bath. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, the, there there are um, resources online that have information on what plants are uh, deer proof. Um, and so you can look at some of that stuff up and and focus your efforts on planting um, those. You know, I have a, I have a friend who lives down in Georgetown and, her entire yard is just full of chicken wire everywhere. Uh, we're all like all the, the rhododendron bushes and everything because the deer just hammer it. And uh, But really focusing your efforts on those plants that deer don't prefer. I'm giving you terrible answers on that. <laughs> yeah. Asking is the sheet mulch method better ecologically than other methods? Um, so I think the one thing that, that from a benefit that I would see is because you're not digging up the sod, you're not digging out those soil organisms that are in the top part of the soil, they remain there. Um, and by pulling the sod out and moving it away and, and, um, and then using that as your garden, because all the grass is still there, those organisms are still in the soil. And so I would think that, that it would be, um, either benign or relatively beneficial to do the sheep mulch uh, method. So, because you're not disturbing the soil as much. Nancy, are jack-o'-lanterns considered invasive? Jack-o'-lanterns? You know the little jack-o'-lanterns? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, I think they, they are. are in places, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because people have been growing them, so naturally we're seeing them over a big hill, and I said, uh oh, they're gonna come my way. Oh, so and it, you know it's the same thing that used to happen with bittersweet. People would get make their bittersweet wreaths, and then when they're done with it, they just whip it over the the stone wall. Um, and so, um, yeah, is is that that's a I'm not familiar with that plant. Is that a vine? Yes. Yeah. Stay, the one that Japanese, the ones that grow up, but it's not a vine. 
Oh, it's not okay. Because no, one of the things I was going to say is stay away from vines. Mm -hmm. They tend to be an issue. <laughs> Yes, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because I was was going to mention that um, it's fine. Like between your um, your perennials, um, it's fine to use bark mulch in a perennial bed. Um, one thing to stay away from is the stuff that's sold as dyed bark mulch. Sometimes you don't know what you're getting in those packages. They dye it for a reason. Um, if you can find um, like shredded bark, I I oftentimes will buy shredded cedar bark, um, which works really great in my garden. Um, but uh, stay away from the stuff that's dyed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was gonna say this when we were on the resources. Um, I own the farmer bookshop. It's the little tiny bookstore that faces the Randy parking lot. And um, I am trying to get a bunch of these really awesome resources um, for everyone at a discount. So um, I've got bookmarks on the page right there. And on my website, there's a, a page that's called Special Deals. And you can click on it. And I've got, I think, about 10 books right now that you can order um, for 25% off of the retail price. And if you have recommendations, I'm looking to increase the options. But... I was trying to think of something to do since I'm not my gardener. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll give everybody great books. <laughs> Any other online questions? I'm not seeing any other online questions. Um, one thing, Nancy Perkins, I remember you talking about the number of plants, different types of plants that you've planted in your yard. Could you talk about that? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> actually, I have because we were on the tour. Um, I know all so they had yes, so people could walk around and see them. So it's it's three pages long, <laughs> but but there are duplicates. Um, and we planted anything from small trees um, to large shrubs to small shrubs. Um, we took out, as I said, the burning bush. Um, and th there are recommendations that, um, and I have some books, my favorites, I put back there on the table, you can look at, but um, alternatives, because the burning bush, I mean, they're striking. Uh, now they, to me, they look unnatural, but they'll substitute for that as like the high, high bush blueberry. So I, we have a bunch of those. I have a lot of uh, berry plants. So um, I some of the areas, instead of doing grasses, I just put out some wild strawberries and they really spread. So I know that bothers some people, but it's, it's um, I don't know, it feels pretty good. So I've got a lot of berry bushes and blueberry, high, low bush blueberry. I've got bear berry which is a small, um, low-growing, slow-growing um, evergreen. Tried that. Um, we've got shrubs that are winterberry and um, uh, inkberry. So there's um, we took out some boxwood um, shrubs because they aren't native and they aren't really doing anything. So, uh, so an inkberry plant. So now there's not that many. Uh, shrubs that are evergreen that are native there's there is holly but something about that looks sharp and pointy <laughs> i don't i don't like that one but i have a lot of inkberry now and um <clears throat> and so and it gets tricky because you want the berries but you go to the landscape store and they can't really tell you is this a male plant is this a female plant um so I would have special requests um, when they brought in um, different plants that need uh, um, male or female, you know, tell me when there's one with berries. And so they'd call me and I'd go get one with berries. So um, so that, the whole idea is to get the birds to come and feast over the winter. And I can't. I can't absolutely say they're coming in droves, <laughs> but 
I'm working on it and uh, we have bird feeders and so so it is wonderful and I just love that bird bath. Um yeah, bayberry. Um so anyway, I've got I printed out some lists if if you if you want Does that answer the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So well, no, what, okay, I'll, I'll say one thing before I forget, I'm going to say it. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I keep a yard list of birds, um, of everything that's been in my yard. And I've had 41 different species of birds in my yard. And so to me, that's a pretty good success rate, you know, in terms of, of having biodiversity in my yard. So just on a small piece of property that, that you can get that, that number of species coming there. So uh, we had an online question asking if you could comment on the environmental impacts of planting with peat moss. Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know if anybody's ever seen a peat mine, but um, I've um, I've been up to an area in northern Maine where where they do peat mining, and basically what they're doing is they're taking the upper layer of the peat off. And that's what they're drying to sell is peat moss. And if you think about how um, the rate of, of how fast peat moss grows, it doesn't grow very fast. And so there's this huge expanse of area that's basically just just brown um, because they've taken the mine the peat moss off the top. So you know that it's a real dilemma because um, you know you have uh, peat moss makes a really great um, component within um, create, you know, mixing your own um, uh, garden soil. Um, a lot of pots are made out of, of peat and you wonder about, um, is it better for me to have that peat pot versus this plastic pot that's gonna fall apart in a couple of years. And, you know, one thing I will say is I think that the, the landscaping business has a plastic problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, every year when we're getting our plants, it's like, what do I do with these plastic pots that I, they come in? I try to reuse everything. Um, when I do get plants in peat pots, they do last a, a number of years. So I reuse those peat pots. But, you know, I think that your the options, the alternates to peat moss are like core. Um, and you think about, well, that's great. But also, you know, how how good are these these big expanses of, of um, you know, palm groves. Uh, so it's it's a hard thing to figure out whether or not what you should be using, what you shouldn't be using. Um, I think the big thing is if you can do as much as you can to reuse. So if you're using, um, you know, if you're doing container gardening where you're using peat moss as a component of your, your container soil, um, save it every year. Re revitalize it and reuse it um, so that you're not depending on having to go get peat moss every year. So that's, there's just, there really aren't that many great alternatives that I know of. Um, if anybody else knows of anything, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, I just, just bought a house in New Bath, so it's the whole new canvas thing, <laughs> way too much lawn. Um, so this has all been very exciting to hear and think about. One issue I have is sitting on a, a you know, the house sits on a hillside, it's lawn, it's been very carefully graded to shunt the, the, the ample rain away from the house and everything, and, you know, the water runs on top of the grass and these, is, is I mean, in terms of using native plants and dealing with a road, you know, Soil stabilization and stuff like that. What, what would you recommend in that? Leave the sod or, or um, you know. Yeah, I mean, one thing you could could consider is terracing. Um, so if you create terraces with um, either rocks or whatever, so that you you don't have that that water issue going down the slopes. That's what I've done it on portions of my yard. But you know, I don't have very long slopes. It's like you know, from here down to there. Um, and so I'm able to to create some terraces so that I don't have that runoff problem. Um, but if you can do terracing, that's a good way to do it. Um, and the other you know thing you can do is make sure you're mulching heavy enough so that the soil is not getting washed away. Um, if you're if you have to to plant on that slope, um, and just make sure you have have good 
um, mulch down. It may, you know, if you're if you're just starting to plant um, and your plants aren't well established, it may take you know a number of years before your soil is stabilized by whatever you put in. So. It's based on basic, but let me know whether the plants are truly um, native or not. Yeah, that, that's a really great question because there's you can get so many plants that are cultivars of our native plants. Um, you know, that may be better than just getting non-native plants, but a lot of what you get in the nursery are not true native plants. They're starting to get better about um, a pro about selling native plants. And I think when you go to a nursery, if you can encourage them, to try to get some native plants in, um, really the the <clears throat> the best way is to make sure that you're getting your plants from um, a reputable place that that uh, it's part of their business is to do native um, to grow native plants. Like I said, the Wild Seed Project, Maine Audubon every year has has a native plant sale. Um, you have to get there early because they sell out of stuff. Um, but and it's become really, really popular. But they do that every April, I think, is their native plant sale. Is that right? Looking at their webpage, it looks like you can order native plants oh. from Maine Audubon online. Now. Okay. Um, so they do have their native plant sale. I think there's information on it in the back. But you can also potentially buy native plants from them just through their website. Yep. Yeah. So you know, I think in Wild Seed Project, Maine Audubon. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if the Native Plant Trust sells plants. I think they just have information. Um, June 8th is the Audubon plant sale. Oh, okay. June 8th. So at, at their Falmouth at um, Gilsland Farm. Yeah. So you mentioned red spruce kind of moving out. Yeah. Are there other plants that are moving in that will, they're not native now, but will be? Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that I, that I think it's worthwhile is taking a look at um, some species that are sort of on the edge of, of Maine or even species that are farther south in Maine. One of the things that, so I'm on the forestry committee, which by the way, the forestry committee needs three new members if anybody's interested. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we've done with the forestry committee is we've been looking at trees that are um, really restricted more to Southern Maine. And those are the trees that we've been trying to get into the nursery rather than getting trees that are um, that are either farther north in Maine or, or you know, um, uh, you know, in this or non-native trees or, you know, established in this area. So this past year we put in, um, we got black gum, which is um, a tree that's, it's native to this part of Maine, but it's not very, abundant. It's much more common farther south. Um, so we, and we also got in hornbeam, which is a, a shrub, um, a small tree. Uh, and that's more common farther south. This year, we're looking at things like, I think we got some, um, we just did our order. I think we looked at getting some shagbark hickory. It's native to this area, but it's at the northern limit of its range here. And so we're looking at those species that are common um, in Southern Maine down to York County, and then even looking into places like Massachusetts, um, we know that those those trees are be, are gonna do fine in, in um, under climate change. Things like, you know, wondering about things like tulip poplar, which is a native tree that's um, very common in the Appalachians, but um, in the, the Appalachian chain, but isn't really, it's not native to Maine, but um, it does perfectly well up here now. Um, things like sassafras, um, is a small shrub. Um, so there's a this tree atlas that I mentioned with the U.S. Forest Service website um, has some of that information on it of um, what trees are going to be okay. And I think there's there's also um, on that site they may also have um, distribution maps that show how that distribution is going to change over time. Um, and so you could take a look at that too, and um, maybe make your choices based on some of that. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I will say is you know, to stay away from things that you know have um, non-native pest impacts. So, you know, we have hemlock woolly adelgid, don't plant any hemlocks. They're not gonna, they're not gonna survive. We have, we're on the brink of getting emerald ash borer. Um, it may be here in Bath, it's in Brunswick. Um, don't put any ash trees in. So, you know, being careful about what your choices are based on what we know about pest species. We have five more minutes um, if anyone has questions. Great. Well, please do help yourself to the information that's on the back table.
Yep. Yeah. All right. So, so thank you all for coming. Um, on the back tables, we have a handout sheet that includes um, a list of a great variety of web resources. That's in the back table back there. There's information from Maine Audubon. There's also some information about the Bath Climate Action Commission's upcoming program that we do in partnership with window dressers. Um, that's a program where volunteers help to build window inserts, um, or first they go out and they measure houses um, that need window inserts, so we'll measure the windows. So we need volunteers for that in the summer. Um, and then in the fall, there's a week of kind of intensive building of window inserts. And these inserts are great. They can go in your old windows and help block out drafts and increase the heat of your house. Um, we, so this is the last um, Bath Climate Action Commission and Kelt and Library um, climate conversation of the season. We will be having more starting next fall. Um, the uh, Climate Action Commission is in the process now and the city is in the process of going through a, of starting a vulnerability assessment. And so we're excited to share more about that, um, or I, I'm sorry, of developing a climate action plan. We've, we're past the vulnerability assessment, now we're out of the plan. So we're working on the plan and we're really excited to get feedback from the community and we'll be sharing more about that 